Now I'd like to invite Sarah Noble to come up and talk about uh, the lunar program from the Science Mission Directorate perspective. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks, and thank you, Carly, for that last comment. That's a perfect introduction to, to my discussion. So we're going to talk a little bit about our new lunar discovery and exploration program, um, and I hope that will be of interest to everybody here. So uh, I'm hoping that most of you have heard about this at some point by, by NASA, Space Policy Directive 1, back in December. Uh, we were instructed to, to go back to the moon. We'll re oh, this thing is a little, okay. Lead the return of humans to the moon. Right, so we are marching forward on that. Um, we've got something of a plan. This is the new um, agency-wide PowerPoint slide. You can see that the moon is bigger than it has been in the past. Mars got a little smaller. It's all it's still there, but we keep moving the pieces around a little bit. Uh, this is the new agency chart that we're calling the DNA chart. Okay. This is the big overview of everything that we're sort of doing on the moon right now, and I will break this down a little bit and go through some of these things. And this is just sort of the top level. Um, I would like to point out that um, as we've started ramping up this program, we have come to you guys, this, this, the lunar community, for a lot of input. The league has been fantastic. We put together a couple of league sats, um, the Advancing Science of the Moon. There are copies of that here available for you. It's also online. You can find it, as well as the next steps on the moon. Uh, I want to thank those of you, many of you participated in those things, and I want to thank you guys for some great hard work on that. Um, the Advancing Science of the Moon is largely an update to the SCHEM report. So the SCHEM report is now a decade old. And as we learned, we have learned a lot of more new things about the moon in the last decade. And so we, we felt the need to sort of update that and see, like, how, we, how are we doing? What have we learned since then? How do we need to update that? So uh, that's what's in that uh, ASM report. Uh, we had the, the, landing, the landed sci Lunar Science for Landed Missions workshop here back in January. Uh, those things are all archived. You can go and look at those talks uh, and discussions we had. Um, there's also a report on that that we'll be hearing from later this, this morning. Um, and I want to alert you to another workshop that we'll be doing this fall, uh, just in advance of the league meeting, on surviving and operating through the, through the lunar night. This is our big tall pole for the moon, right? We, we, otherwise, we can only have you know, up to 14-day missions, and we certainly wanted to have some longer ones, and so this is a big... Uh, challenge for both the human and science sides of the house. So we're going to get together along with the technology STMD mission directorate and put together a workshop to try and brainstorm some ideas for how to solve those challenges. Okay, so this lunar exploration campaign, if we start at the top of that chart, uh, you can see these things are, are labeled, I'll get used to this, uh, SMD or HEO, depending on who is leading these things, and you'll see that it bounces back and forth, that, that we are really working together on a number of things. Some things SMD is taking the lead, some things HEO is taking the lead, some things we are very well cu coupled. Um, this is, a, this is an, a, one NASA adventure. We're trying to do this all together. Uh, to of reference to many of you in this room, the Survey Can 3 draft has been released. Yvonne mentioned that earlier. I'm not going to really talk about that this morning, but... I am here all week. If you've got questions, the, the question period is open until July 3rd. Uh, so let us know how you, what you think of the draft. Um, uh, as far as Rose's things, we, we had a new call put out for the Apollo Next Generation Sample Analysis. Uh, the NOIs were due for that last week. We got in a lot of them. We're pretty happy about that. Um, the NOIs are, are optional, though, so if you've meant to put in an NOI and you didn't, you still can. <laughs> so you're not left out, of, out in the cold. Um, so uh, you, you can still submit a proposal even without an NOI, but if you are planning to submit a proposal, we would appreciate an NOI even if it's late, just so that we have a heads up. Uh, we also added language to, to many of our other calls, SSWEW, PDART, PSTAR, SSO, to encourage lunar proposals. Um, we also still encourage lunar proposals in LDAP. That should be obvious. Um, and, and we put out a new call for something called the Development and Advancement of Lunar Instruments, DALI. This is a, an instrument program to develop sort of mid-TRL uh, instruments. Uh, those proposals were due June 5th. We received 47 Step 2 proposals. That's, a, that's quite a, a whopping number. It was more than we were expecting, so I'm glad to see that the community is quite excited about this. Uh, these are in lunar instruments that support uh, both NASA's uh, science goals as well as our exploration goals and ISRU goals. And we are particularly instrument, interested in instruments for small stationary landers, but open for, for other kinds of instruments, orbiters, rovers, whatever you got. 
And we're most interested right now in technologies that will reach TRL6 within the next couple of years. We're looking for things that will be ready soon, but we're also trying to prepare for things that will be needed down the road. Okay, so then let's see, the next thing on this list, uh, CubeSats, right? So we've got uh, both the current, the, the Luna map uh, and the HeoMD CubeSats. There's a call out in the street for Simplex uh, that includes lunar proposals. Um, in addition, we've got the Korean Pathfinder Lunar Orbiter uh, Participating Scientist Program. It's about to be released. I don't think it's been quite released yet, but it should be out on the street soon. Uh, and LRO, of course, continues to operate and provide excellent data for our future missions, so doing okay there. Uh, if you move down this chart a little bit into the, the next zone, swim lane, uh, you can see this thing called Small Commercial Lunar Lander Initiative. Right, so this is um, small commercial landers and payloads, something we're calling CLIPS. CLIPS, that's the new acronym you're going to have to learn. Commercial Lunar Payload Services. Uh, the draft for this is out on the street. Um, the final RFP should be out reasonably soon. Um, we expect to um, select, this is, okay, it's a lot of um, procurement language in here, but this will be a multi-vendor catalog, 10-year IDIQ contract. <laughs> which means that we're going to select a number of these companies. Um, anybody, basically, who can prove that they can land on the moon, we're going we're to add them to this catalog. Uh, it's a 10-year contract, so for the next 10 years, we can put out task orders that say, we, bring, we want you to bring this to the moon, and those, those companies, whoever is in the catalog, can bid on that uh, and, and take those payloads to the moon. So this is intended, this is a new way of doing business for NASA. This is very much intended to be uh, a delivery service. We give them our payload and they deliver it to the moon. We are not involved in what rocket they pick. We're not involved in how they, they manage to do it. They're, they're just instructed to deliver it to the moon for us. So this is a very different way for NASA to think. It's a new way of doing things. Um, but as, as Carly said, right, this is an opportunity. This is not a one-time mission. This is a growing, evolving thing that, that will um, provide us many opportunities uh, to get things down to the surface of the moon, which is pretty exciting. Uh, we are hoping to have these uh, first vendors selected by the end of the year. Uh, and, and we're structuring this right now for NASA to be the, the marginal buyer of this commercial service, right? We are not expected to be the only customers for these commercial companies. We are expecting them to have other, other com companies, other na nations, other um, universities, you know, wherever, they're, wherever they want to do business with, it's not up to us. We're just buying whatever space we need on their spacecraft and they can fill that spacecraft up with what, whoever else wants to buy space on it. So that is the way we are structuring this. We understand that in the beginning, NASA will probably be the, the major uh, person, people involved, but we don't want to be the only ones. Okay, so our next job is to figure out what we're going to put on these flights, right? So what payloads are available right now for these flights? Well, I've got, there's an RFI on the street right now, a request for information. I've got, I just checked, and I've got a couple dozen actual RRD submissions to that, so that's good. Just giving us a, a feel for what the landscape is right now. Um, part of that's going to flow into, we are working on a Salmon 3 AO for payloads that are ready or nearly ready to fly. This is not to develop an instrument. This is, I've got hardware on the shelf. I've got this flight spare, this engineering model. It's, it's, all, it's basically ready to go. Let's, let's throw it at the moon. Um, in the meantime, we've got, uh, we have asked Goddard to build us some retroreflectors. Uh, these are very simple, small, lightweight, easy instruments. Uh, we just wanted to have some, some on hand so that we have hardware on hand. I want to be clear about this because I've, it's apparently I've already caused some confusion that this is not the last word in retroreflectors, right? If you guys have, have retroreflectors that are different designs, that are better designs, we are all for that. This is just we wanted to have hardware on hand that we knew we had in the bag that we could, we could put on things. But it's not necessarily the only retroreflectors we're ever going to send to the moon, just to be clear. Um, and then uh, resource prospector, I'm not going to... I'm not going to go into too much depth on Resource Prospector. We can talk about that over beers tonight if you would like. <laughs> um, but um, a little bit about the Salmon P. Again, these are for payloads that are ready or nearly ready to fly. Uh, it is very open. It's a very cross-divisional, cross-directorate call. It'll be open to planetary, helio, astro, earth science, whatever kind of science you want to do. Open to any kind of SKG, um, exploration science you're interested in. 
and, and STMD things as well, things that are technology developments that we want to see for the moon, not just science instruments. We are going to allow a, a significant amount of international participation, not international proposals, but if they are partnering with, with a USPI, that's great. Uh, and right now we're, we're going to put a limit for these first ones, uh, a pretty low weight limit on them because we are paying by the pound now for these instruments to deliver them, right? So the bigger the instrument, the more expensive it is for us to fly. And these first ones are going to be high risk, so we're going to start with, with cheaper things, but that will evolve over time. Uh, this will be an, an interesting sort of two-step process for this call, uh, different from our usual two-step down select. We're going to have, <coughs> excuse me, uh, a phase one, sort of get your instrument ready to fly. This will not guarantee you fly, you fly. If you get selected from this AO, it doesn't guarantee you a flight, but it puts you in this catalog. We're going to select a bunch of these. Uh, and then when a particular flight opportunity is identified, uh, we will provide the additional funds at that point, and there'll be an internal process based on ease of accommodation, timeline, appropriateness, et cetera, for which instruments we will fly when. OK, just a, a last thing about the resource prospector here. Um, we have done a study uh, internally to looking at the science of the, the resource prospector instruments. All four instruments are doing great um, and are going to be good instruments for the moon. <coughs> Excuse me. So we're going to continue to develop them. Um, SMD is going to continue to pay for those instrument developments. And eventually, we will integrate these onto whichever is appropriate uh, CLIPS missions. Uh, finally, this is the, the bottom part of that exploration campaign uh, diagram. And it just shows that we're, we are moving towards bigger and more capable uh, landers and sample returns, including, I want to point out, um, you know, sample return does make the list here. So it is, has not been forgotten about. We are working on it. Uh, and this is just my last slide. I just want to remind everyone that there is excellent science to be done at every step of the way while we prepare here, from these sort of small stationary landers, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> to, uh, to cube sets and small sets, longer lived landers, small rovers, large rovers, eventually sample return. You guys have, have provided us with all sorts of, oh, thank you. <laughs> um, you guys have provided us with all sorts of great ideas for um, <clears throat> what to do at every one of these steps along the way, and I'm sure you will con continue to do so. So, thank you. Okay, I'm going to let her uh, have a drink here uh, before we start questions. Uh, please line up at the microphone if you have a question for Sarah. I also want to tell you that we, too, are annoyed by this flickering <laughs> that you're noticing, and I think it's getting worse with time. So our tech folks want the break period to look at it and try and fix it. So what I've asked Ben to do is uh, postpone his <coughs> talk until after the break. So after this question period now, we're going to take our break, and then when we come back, we're going to pick up with Ben's uh, perspective from headquarters from the HEOMD side. But for now, let's ask Sarah questions from her very nice talk. Okay, yeah, Sarah, um, could you tell okay. us more about DALI proposals? When, when do you plan to do a selection? And if there is a way for DALI to actually go into the salmon at one stage down the line? Because at the end of the day, you're still going to be developing tier on six instruments, which could potentially fit the phase two of your salmon uh, call, right? Yeah, um, there is no reason why those proposals. <coughs> oh, geez. I don't know where the frog came from. There's no reason why, why the, the, those Dolly proposals can't evolve into things that would be proposed to the salmon. And when, when is selection <coughs> going to happen? Do you have a. a uh, hmm, let's see, proposals were due probably late fall, early winter. Okay. <laughs> all right. Sarah, Noah Petra, NASA Goddard. First of all, I have a comment and a question, but an actual comment. Thank you for doing all this. I know this is why you slaved away at Brown for six years getting your PhD, <laughs> is negotiating <laughs> contracts with commercial vendors. It's, that was a class that Carly taught. It was a great seminar. <laughs> um, but the question is, for the commercial landers, um, what about interfaces between instrument, onboard processing, data relay storage? How is that? Is there going to be a standard um, 
interface for that, or is that something that has to be negotiated with, e with each partner? Yeah, um, it sort of has to be negotiated. <coughs> Jeez, I don't know what the heck. It takes you um, away. I know, <laughs> I know, right? It's amazing. Um, the first step, once we get these contracts done in December, mm -hmm. will be uh, for each of them to provide us a user's guide, right? And that will, um, maybe that's a better. Uh, a user's guide that will help us understand what, what um, each of the, their instruments or landers are going to do. Um, we are hopeful that we will sort of standardize, right, that, that you know, it's, it's better for everybody um, if we do come to sort of standards. A lot of this is going to require conversations with these com companies, so I, I hope that you guys are talking to them. Um, I, I really want to encourage you, t you do actually talk to them uh, about their landers and, and how, to, how to best work these interfaces. But right now, we're, we're sort of, we're both trying to get to the same place at the same time. So it, it you know, we're doing our best. Okay, we're gonna have just two more questions. And Sarah Barbaro and Nessa Goddard. Um, I'm curious as how you're going to um, set the priorities. And I know this is probably a really premature question um, because I, I saw on your slide, some of it is what's ready now. Um, but there's yeah. also going to be a conversation about what are the highest priority measurements that we want to do on the moon. And Dave Kring mentioned this too. It's not just whatever we can do. There are some really important things that we want to do. Um, and, and then you've got a really broad mix in there of science and HEO and tech development. And, and all of those things come with their own sets of priorities and their own communities behind them. So have you, I'm sure you have thought about it. Can you tell us a little more about what you're thinking about, how you're going to prioritize cheap, ready to go with really important? Right, so this gets back to Carly's comment again, right, that this isn't a one-time opportunity. This is we're building a program. So these first missions are going to be pretty limited, right? They're near side, short duration, you know, less than one day. They're going to be wherever the, the commercial company wants to land, probably be someplace flat and boring, right? But that's not, that's just the first missions, right? Eventually, right, they'll get more, we'll get more comfortable with them, they'll get more brave. Um, there, there will be polar landings, we, you know, we, that's certainly high on our list. We will, we are working on evolving capabilities to last the night. We expect these capabilities to expand as we go, and we will have more time to sort of craft better payloads, right, than the, these first ones, which are like, you know, what do we have right now? Let's get it up there. But as time goes on, we'll have more time to plan out and be more strategic about these things. So, so there is, we are planning both for the short term and the long term. And that's why we have the Dolly call for, you know, later things. That's why, you know, we, we're sort of trying to plan both for what do we need immediately, but also, you know, what, what, what is this program going to look like down the road? This is a 10-year contract, right, so we do have some time to to sort of evolve this thing as that goes. Are, are there going to be priorities like per mission? Like here's an HEO mission, here's an SMD mission, or is it throw them all in the mix and the review panel is going to sort it out? Like, we yeah, we are working. I mean, we're working pretty closely with HEO right now. Um, that you know, the, this program sits in SMD, but. And so the funds are ours, and we are in charge of them. But we have been, it's been very, made very clear to us that this is an agency-wide program and that we need to buy, balance everybody's priorities. And so we are, we are in you know, very regular contact with, the, with HEO and STMD. We are having weekly conversations about you know, what we all need to do and how the best way to do these things are. And I think that, you know, at least for these early missions, right, the, the choices that we make are going to be more about what makes sense for this mission and the, this capabilities. Um, and so, you know, wh whoever's instrument makes the most sense is what's going to go. Uh, but we will have to have sort of more strategic discussions later on down the road to make sure that everybody's needs are met. Thanks. Okay, this will be a quick question and answer. Uh, when you're buying clips, uh, payload capacity, are you going to be specifying any landing site uh, restrictions or requirements? Uh, we can. So the, the contract is set up so that each one of these things is a task order and we can put whatever it is we need into those task orders. Right? So if you have to land in a specific place, if you have to land on a st specific type of material, if you have to, like, whatever your requirements are, we can, we can put them into that task order. 